Justin Hancock, you are a different kind of guest for me. I'm really looking forward to exploring what you're up to and what you write about. Justin, in your own words, how would you like to describe who is Justin Hancock? Uh, I'm a relationships and sexuality educator, uh, working with young people and adults um, online and in person since 1999. Uh, so kind of been doing this for a long time now, I guess. You certainly have. So tell us, Justin, how you got into this. What was your path into this this field? Um, through uh, youth work. So I was doing a degree in law for some reason. and uh, But during <laughs> the summer holidays, I was working with young people. Um, and I kind of thought, well, I enjoy this more. And there were many barriers for me being a lawyer as well. Um, so after I graduated, I uh, trained with the Derby City Council Youth Service, and they gave me really excellent training on how to work with young people. And then as part of that training, I specialized in working with young men around masculinities. And that led to me getting a job working with young men around masculinities and sexual health and relationships in 1999. And that's how I got into it. Since then, I've been working for various uh, charities, local authorities, and since 20, well, I've been a freelance since around 20, completely freelance since around 2014, uh, delivering training courses. Mm. But also I run a, a website for young people called BISH, which is visited by thousands of people a day. It's one of the leading sexuality education resources online. Um, and I also have my own podcast, Culture Sex Relationships. So it's kind of all led to all of that really, yeah. It sounds great. Um being trained as a lawyer how has that informed or changed the way you've dealt with things i mean i assume you you have some kind of fidelity towards what you did in law and how much that makes you think about the small print and everything um yeah not really yeah i mean <laughs> um yeah I, I did a law degree so i'm not trained as a lawyer but i suppose what i think what degrees do and what any education does is to is to teach you to think and to teach you to learn. I think that's the thing that I took away from it. I think there's some interesting stuff there about intentionality and uh, mens rea in the criminal law and things like that, which I think I've definitely kind of taken with me. Um, and causation is really kind of interesting kind of, I was mainly interested in the criminal law, which sadly is only a very small part of a law degree. <laughs> Everything else I found really dull, sadly. Sorry to anyone who's a legal scholar who's listening who really, really enjoys it. But um, yeah, it hasn't really been super relevant, apart from when I write and talk about the law and sexuality, which can be very complex and very tricky. And there's a huge difference between the law itself, but also how the law is implemented and how, uh, for example, Crown Prosecution Service guidelines differ to the actual written law about things like Sexual Offences Act 2003. But yeah, apart from that, it's not really equipped me for a career in sexuality education <laughs> well um i possibly want to get back into that when we uh, talk a little later about contracting uh, after consent mm -hmm. but um let's say over the last 20 years uh, it seems to me that we've had a lot of change that has under has been seen in society mm -hmm. especially in the west i suppose mm -hmm. with regard to sexuality and sex how would you describe where where we are today compared to when you began in 1999 mm. i think in some ways there's been a huge amount of change and in other ways there's been very little change i think certainly the culture around sex so i think within that time frame we've experienced what we would call sex positivity which is a response to what people regard as sex negativity. And I suppose a good shorthand for sex negativity is for dear listener, if you are thinking about your own sex education, uh, if your sex education was um, sex is about penis and vagina sex, and it's about reproduction, uh, don't get pregnant. Here are some um, gory images of sexually transmitted infections. It's something only adults do, don't do it. It's very bad for you. Um, that is a lot of people's experience of their own sex education. And I think a useful shorthand for that is what people just call sex negativity, where sex is only about 
reproduction, but it's not about uh, pleasure. It's not about, it barely talks about relationships. It's very kind of mechanical, but only biological and mechanical about a particular kind of reproductive act. Consent's never mentioned. Talking about sex is never mentioned. And people are left with the feeling that it's a shameful topic that we shouldn't talk about and that we and so therefore people aren't given the vocabulary or the confidence to be able to talk about it. I think in that time, we've seen sex positivity. So pioneers of this are probably shows like Sex and the City, which I like to hate on for because it's, it's a flawed show in many ways. But it's one of those key kind of pieces of media that... Um, that really kind of set a benchmark for a new way of talking about sex. I think we've seen that in lots of other ways in society. And I certainly think that there is a feminist element to that, where we're trying to get women to, or try to allow women or invite women to be able to have their own kind of sexual subjectivity. And I think, which is really good and useful. And I think we've had really important conversations about consent more recently. And I think people are wanting to think more critically about relationships and to think differently about how they do relationships. I think that's certainly been the case over the last 20 years. But the things that haven't really changed, I think, are we still have this very strong like heteronormativity, this uh, expectation uh, of the um, that you'll have that you will be heterosexual. Um, I think that is changing, but we still have it. I think we have a lot of normativities as well about what really what what counts as real sex and um, still very, very strong uh, social sexual scripts that people find very tricky to navigate still. And because of our lacking sex education, people still often find very tricky to talk about. And um, and there's a lot of shame and stigma around talking about it. So I think we still have that, too. So there's a long way to go. I still certainly have a lot of work to do along with uh, everyone else working in this field. I can only imagine. Um, but let's, what about from the, you, you typically tend to work with younger, but I mean, you obviously work with older as well, but the, the in the younger field, I have two children, 26 and 24. Hmm. So I, I've sort of gone through the younger period. Um, they're now sort of full-fledged young adults. Hmm. Over the years, how have you seen the discussions you've held with 14 to, let's say, 18-year-olds? Mm. How, how has that changed? Well, one, I was talking about this the other day with somebody, so it's, in, it's fresh on my mind. So I've worked a lot with young men over the years. And 20 or so years ago, it would be quite common for me to hear from young men um, I don't care whether she's enjoying it as long as I'm enjoying it. That's all that really matters. Um, and now I never hear that. I'm much more like to hear, Justin, how can I make her come? How can I last longer? How can I have better stamina in bed? And how can I be better at it? And I think they're both problematic because they are kind of, they're still both kind of um, centering the, the, the man's experience. So the man is the subject and the woman is the other. Uh, but I think it's a different kind of subjectivity that they are wanting to do this thing of giving an orgasm to the woman as if that's something that kind of belongs to the guy. But I think that that is a, so it's still problematic, but I think it is a big shift. And I think that speaks to the sex positivity that I was talking about earlier, that there is this kind of a greater acceptance and a greater um, expectation and pressure uh, for people to experience pleasurable orgasmic sex. And I think that people find it very difficult to navigate both of those things. And I think the, the approach that I try to take, which is the one that I took with my co-author of my uh, first book, Enjoy Sex, How, When, and If You Want To, um, my co-author was uh, Meg John Barker. I think the kind of the position we tried to take was to to be what we called sex critical. So where we try to encourage people to see the messages that they receive in society and these kind of dominant kinds of discourses and to critique them, but also to try to make sense of them and to use what um, 
Michel Foucault would call uh, technologies of the self, where we we gather our uh, our various sexual knowledges and our various experiences and our listening to our own body and um, and being in tune with it, with ourselves and our desires. How can we use that assemblage of things in order to create and recreate our own sexual versions of ourselves? And I think that's the kind of approach that is the most useful because it is about resourcing. It's about giving, it's about um, giving us a, a using using our kind of own experience and our own sexual knowledges and things we pick up as as resources rather than simply being told what to do by um by people and i think that's the kind of that's the approach that i think is the most useful and the one that um yeah i think the most valuable and most useful yeah well it seems like it it's pointing towards the idea of self responsibility mm. I think it's um we certainly try not to and I certainly try uh really hard not to kind of individualize um people uh but I think that there is a a degree to which sex and relationships are and how we feel about ourselves are kind of um private things which have been privatized which is complex so you know we talk about sex as being private uh, which I think a lot of people still consider it to be, you know, it's kind of can only be talked about in certain forums and and certainly um, not everyone wants to hear about it. But then that there is also, in addition to that, it's been kind of privatised by the the messages we receive in society about sex. So if we're told when we're, when we're younger that sex is shameful, shouldn't really talk about it and any sex education we receive leaves us feeling awkward uncomfortable and shocked um then that further privatizes it which means that it does become it does end up being this kind of individual kind of uh like tussle this kind of uh this kind of solo quest to discover our own sexuality and actually if we'd have had a better sex education, and the thing that I try to do is that if we have the tools to be able to talk about this with other people, then we would understand that our idea of ourselves can only exist in relation to other selves and that we we aren't these individual atomized units, that we all exist in relation to into everything else and that we are um, an assemblage of lots of different things. Uh, and I think that that also is the crucial way forward to kind of to make people look outwards for um, or to facilitate people looking outwards for connection and understanding and becoming rather than inwards for some kind of um, lack or uh, essential story of themselves. Mm, interesting. So the way I... I say I would approach the this interview with you, Justin, was to think about also the changes that have happened at a societal level mm. and and to see to what extent there are links. I mean, there are two statistics. I don't have the exact details because it it varies from country to country, but very well documented that there we are having less sex, mm. uh, at least uh, according to whatever definition <laughs> that those yeah. surveys come with. and And second of all, we're having less children in the west hmm. so let's call that a uh, a heterosexual ter typical type of uh, hmm. of statistic yet i have to believe it there's a link with the work that you're doing and i wonder to what extent that those phenomena uh, impacted you and uh, what are you seeing in your therapy in the work that you do mm. yeah I, I should just just uh i don't do therapy just as a disclaimer though uh folks so i can't right. go around calling myself a therapist but i'm an educator but um um yeah there are a couple of really interesting questions i think that on the, the first point about people having less sex the the study i get my go-to study about this in the uk is the nat cell study yeah. which is a huge academic study which is done every 10 years it's extraordinarily rigorous and there's another one there's another one due out now. COVID delayed it. The last one came out in 2011. And it's usually done every 10 years. So there have been three iterations of it. And we're all very excited about 
uh, Nat South 4. Come on, Nat South 4. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and but with that study, they were finding that people were having less penis and vagina sex, uh, but they were possibly having more different kinds of sex. That are kind of it did seem like there was some evidence that there was a broader repertoire of sexual activity. So perhaps people are having uh, less sex, but more sex that they want, more intentional sex, more sex for sex for sex sake, more sex for pleasure, but also. Um, perhaps people by not having sex or having a better time. <laughs> you know, there's a, a a lot of sex can be really bad, and particularly if it's if we're just following a sexual script, doing it because we think we owe it to to our partners. You know, and so I think that what I was talking about before, the kinds of um, the increasing understanding of the role of pleasure and how we might have it. Uh, and how this is a this uh, this kind of thing of um, being embodied and being feeling a bit more sexually empowered, I think might well could understandably result in better but best uh, better sorry less but better sex <laughs> or less but more enjoyable sex or or just different kinds of and also it depends on the study, doesn't it? As you say, so yeah. you know some studies might not see um, having a snog as being sex but i think they should <laughs> because having a snog is deeply sexual and can be incredibly pleasurable well, well also we need to clarify for the non-english speakers because they're not oh, english yeah. british because snog is is quite a british term yeah i use very british terms all the time yeah open mouth kissing or french kissing um yeah yeah in french i think it's called galoche <laughs> <laughs> but we are right they call it french kissing as well so yeah okay um yeah yeah so the idea of of less but better um i also have other things which are in my wheelhouse which i typically look at Mm. which is the vast increases of anxiety declared anxiety and depression Mm. specifically among the younger generations Mm. so i can't equate with that a uh, an uptick in happiness or Mm. in better mental health and i wondered to what extent the the issues around sex have played a role in this uh, increase of anxiety and depression well i think there are a lot of things that are connected here i think that if people have anxiety and depression that can it often means that they are less likely to be able to enjoy sex um but i don't but also if it, it, it's about kind of cart before the horse so sometimes if people are less able to enjoy sex that might also have an effect on their mental health too so i'm not trying to draw any kind of dry direct lines of causation or anything like that but i think generally if we're talking about anxiety and depression i think we also have to kind of consider the material impacts um that are actually that have happened and not to sound like a a, uh uh you know the uh the left-wing uh nerd that i am but the life is harder for a lot of people particularly young people and particularly during covid uh you know covid really heightened a lot of pre-existing um mental health problems uh and so i think that we you know looking at you know so i was talking about the derby city council youth service the other day uh the other day uh, earlier on in our conversation where i received my training and you know they had youth clubs and projects all over the city including the specialist health uh, specialist youth work team people like me who would go in and do stuff around sexual health and relationships but also other kinds of specialist kind of education as well none of that exists anymore in the same way and that's true for a lot of places around the country that the 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 lack of things for young people to do outside of school is really quite stark and so if there are fewer places for young people to spend time with each other face to face um making connections and you know socializing and also being able to access support and resources from each other but also people like youth workers then that is going to have a knock-on effect on people's mental health but also 
the lack of space generally for young people, I think, you know, so many areas in geographic areas have been kind of privatized places where young people can just kind of hang out are much more heavily monitored and controlled. And so I think that plus the pull of mobile phones and the internet and laptops has kind of has shrunk a lot of young people's lives, I think, in ways which certainly I think are part of the assemblage that we need to talk about when we're talking about mental health and young people. I also do think that there is something here about <clears throat> the discourses of anxiety and depression being sometimes unhelpfully um, talked about in, in ways where, where instead of thinking about what might we do to feel better about our mental health and to feel better and what are the kinds of ways in which we can um, connect with others that might kind of be really good. I think that when we sometimes, when more broadly we're using the the terminology of diagnosis, then I think that sometimes it mean, it leads people to kind of holding on to the diagnosis rather than thinking about what a diagnosis might do. And so I think that it is a, it's sometimes I think it has a kind of reverse effect where, where, instead of instead of thinking about well if i got some treatment around this or if i was able to access a talking treatment about about this or to be able to get some other kind of resource or support it might help me do dot 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 uh, instead i think sometimes people people would perhaps talk a little bit too much about the diagnoses or the, or the problems rather than the potential solutions um, but also having said that there are material factors there too. So the waiting list for child and, adoles child and adolescent mental health services in the UK, known as CAMS, is huge. It's a massive waiting list. So the ability for young people to find support, it has vastly diminished, as well as the possibilities for young people's mental health to thrive because of the closure of a lot of spaces that young people could hitherto um, access. So I think all of that is kind of involved. And of course, you know, I guess it's harder for people to to connect if they you know, if they're only if the only space where they can connect with other young people is in school, college, university, or well, less so with university, but school or college, then it only gives you a, a very quite a small window in your day where there is the possibility for making friendships, um, uh, experiencing chemistry with people, um, flirting with people, and or you know just kind of you know the the everyday business of um, what I call at my website. Uh, my uh, quoting from the Professor Barbara Friedrichson, uh, psychologist working in the US, micro moments of positivity resonance. So micro moments of positivity resonance are those things that happen on a daily basis where have a glimpse of a bit of eye contact with someone or a little something makes us smile or kind of have a little buzzy feeling from like an interaction with someone at a shop or going someone with a dog and you know stroke their dog and say hello to the owner or you know those kinds of everyday kinds of things if we reduce the, the possibilities for micro moments of positivity resonance which other people call falling in love but i like to call micro moments of positivity resonance then we are reducing the possibilities for people to become and to emerge and but also sorry i'm ranting the the other thing about um school is and and college is that young people are under so much pressure to get grades to become this ideal uh neoliberal subject who is you know very successful at school and can get a job um, in a marketplace and to you know to do a university course which is going to be really good for their career there is so much pressure on young people to not fail and i think that a lot of playfulness and a lot of the potential for soft skills and a lot of the potential for connection has been stripped out of young people's lives in ways which no one asked for and in ways which we don't fully understand how de detrimental they've been and i think in that way it all it all kind of connects to sex and relationships or sexuality and relationships because not so much the act of having sex, but just the the possibilities of seeing people and flirting and having these kind of micro moments with people being a this joyous activity we do with other people, this you know, collective joy, a joyous affect, we, uh, to use like an academic term. And so I think that's the kind of broader picture, and I, that's how that's how I see all of these things kind of um, interacting with each other. Yeah. 
Well, lots of things in there, Justin. Um, I, I was piqued by this notion that the opportunities for young to to meet uh, is reduced and mm -hmm. nobody has asked for it. I'm not sure. I feel like uh, there's this principle of precaution mm -hmm. that is imposed by the ask of parents. Mm -hmm. I don't want my child to be out in the street because it's yeah. dangerous out there. Yeah. And you better put on a mask because it's dangerous out there mm -hmm. and better not uh, hang with them because they're dangerous. And so I, I feel like it, it isn't by mistake, if you will, this idea. The privatization is perhaps a, a new argument that I hadn't thought about, but I definitely see society unwilling to let go, you know, of because I only have one child. Right. You know, and now everything that's my prince or my princess, and they need to survive because mm. I don't have nine other off offspring to help mm. through. And and uh, otherwise my genes will not continue. And there's, so I think there's a lot of intentionality behind this notion of, of not mm. getting together with others. And the harder piece, I mean, we live in, I mean, amazingly progressive, uh, advanced times. Mm. And, and so it's hard for me to, to think uh, of all these mental health issues coming up without thinking that there's a, a causality mm. with, with our, you know, worry about this, worry about that, mm. are, frankly, in, in the way I see things, there's been a lot of reduction of our ability to speak mm. because it, it can trigger. So you have to be particularly careful about any word you use. And in that, there's another piece, which is, well, are you flirting with me or is that that's dangerous? Can let's have consent about flirting. And if we have to contract all these things and eliminate words as any lawyer might from any contract, mm. it makes for a difficult dance and, and creating positive relationships. Yeah. And I certainly have heard this from young people too, uh, and adults. Um, and I think what we're talking about here is consent and um, I've written a book about this. Uh, yes, which is why we're into it. <laughs> and uh, it's very, it's, I mean, excellent hosting there to get me to talk about the book. That's just, not, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really, that's, that's, you're a pro, clearly. The, the issue is, is the way that consent has been talked about and utilised and, and the effect that that's had on young people. So, Nowadays, if I go into a school and say, all right, we're going to do a lesson on consent, everyone just groans and folds their arms and hates me for a minute <laughs> because they think that what they're going to be told is yes means yes, no means no. You always have to ask first before you do absolutely anything and that men are potential um, perpetrators and women are potential victims. And the women and the men and non-binary folk hate consent now they hate talking about it because of these i get quite wound up about this because of the infantilizing and stupid and uh moralizing and legalistic and um black and white binary way that it's been taught the way that consent has been taught has been this top-down approach where it is it has been policymakers and some educators who think well of course i know what consent is I've never done anything non-consensual in my life, <clears throat> but it's these others who don't really understand. So I'm going to give them this message. I'm going to tell them what consent is and why they should do it and why it's important. And we're going to save future generations. And actually, all that has done is to make people feel, as you say, uh, anxious, um, unresourced, feeling unable and feeling like consent is a barrier they have to get over in order to do something, which creates in and of itself much more harmful outcomes which are non-consensual so often what happens is people might um, pester somebody for a yes um, and then once they get that yes uh, it's, everything else seems to be fair game and so we have this really problematic kind of discourse about consent which has produced this binary thing of uh, men have to uh, as reproduce the by the 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 it reproduces gender stereotypes in really problematic ways. 
that there is always one person who has to be the asker and the other person who has to be the the giver of permission. One person is the gatekeeper. In heterosexual relationships, that is, you know, the man being active and the woman has to be passive. And um, in same-sex relationships, that, that the idea that there always has to be a top or a bottom or someone who is the, the confident one who is uh, sexually experienced and somebody who isn't. Rather than consent being this uh, assemblage of um, actions and which can be uh, words, but also our bodies and how our bodies interact with each other, which have the possibility of um, producing collective joy. So rather than consent being a barrier to get over, I think that we should start seeing consent as the things that we do to really enhance having a great time with someone. And how do we have, how do we maximize the possibility of having, experiencing joy for ourselves and with someone else? And all of the things that we do in our everyday lives to do that is what consent is. That is the work of consent. It's ongoing, it's fluid, it's iterative, it's generative, it's co-created, and it's constant. And the act of doing consent in that way can be incredibly joyful. And so I think a really good way of thinking about this is to think about non-sexual examples, because I think that really helps us to, um, to figure out where, what we're talking about here. So one example that I like to talk about a lot is imagine someone's coming over to your house and they're going to watch TV and you've got all the streaming services. OK, who holds the remote? How do you figure out what it is you're going to watch? What, what are the kinds of conversations that we might have? to make someone feel comfortable enough in order that they can say, I don't, I'm not really in the mood for this, or I've seen this before, or these kinds of things scare me, or there are certain things I can't watch. You know, for me, I can't watch anything with um, injections in, like lots of TV and films have injections and they never tell you. Um, so that's my kind of thing that I would say to a friend. Um, how do you make the the it, a comfortable environment where you can both have this conversation? Uh, what kinds of conversations might you have before about it? What kind of conversations might you have about the motivations, like what you want to get out of the evening? Um, do you want to, you, are you having like, are you there mostly to chat or are you there mostly to watch something? Um, uh, you know, if we are, if we are going to watch something, how seriously are we going to watch it? Are we going to watch it, you know, with subtitles on, really pay attention to everything? Or are we going to have something on in the background where we can kind of take the piss out of something and watch it a bit like they do on Gogglebox? Again, it's a UK TV show, which is excellent. Everyone should watch it. It's really, really good. Um, and how do we, if we've agreed on a show that we're going to watch with somebody, you know, just talking about you, dear listener, when you have a friend over, or you're watching something with anyone, um, how do you kind of figure out whether you and the other person is enjoying it? So are they laughing at the funny bits? Are they hiding behind the sofa at the scary bits? Um, are they just kind of yawning? Are they uh, checking their phone during it? Um, are they just kind of looking disinterested or talking about something which clearly isn't the TV? And what kind of things might we do in order to check in as we go? So, you know, when we press pause, when someone goes to the loo or gets a drink or some popcorn or whatever, we could say, oh, how are you feeling about this? Is this still okay? You know, should we carry on for another episode and see how it goes? Or should we try something else? You know, these are the kinds of things that we do. None of that is um, radical. It's the things that we're all doing in all aspects of our lives, this kind of thing. But all of that is, it's this perseverance of sometimes slightly awkward conversations, but we're persevering in order that we can both experience joy. And we do that in all aspects of our life. And the thing that we don't teach young people, well, I teach young people this, and other good sex educators teach young people this, we think that somehow when it comes to sex, sexual consent, we have to say, yes means yes, no means no, get everyone's agreement before you do something, and then and then you can just kind of do it. And no other aspects of our lives do we do this, apart from things like contractual things. So saying... Um, clicking the uh, yes, I accept all your cookies on a website <clears throat> or clicking yes, I understand the terms of conditions of this thing, which no, no one ever reads the terms and conditions. Boring. Uh, yeah, quite. Uh, you know, ticking a box. You know, that kind of consent is the way that uh, sexual consent has been talked about. And so it's no wonder that because young people um, have been taught about consent in that very narrow legalistic terms and conditions, tick a box, contract kind of way, that they're, pissed off about it and 
don't feel like it can help them. And really what consent does is facilitates a really great time. And if we all talked about consent in that way, then I think we'd actually just have a better time in our life. <laughs> there'd be more joy. There'd be more possibilities for collective joy. I just genuinely believe that. Yeah. I, I want to get into that. There's so many other things that I'm my, my mind is percolating on. Uh, you, you mentioned the self technology of Michel Foucault. Um, I can't help but think since we haven't addressed it, uh, there are other technologies that have impacted heavily this notion of consent and what is sex uh, in the form mm -hmm. of online porn yeah. and dating apps. Mm. And, and, I, and I suspect that in the latter, the this the the legal elements within it somehow have constrained the freedoms i mean at some level there's it appears to open the freedoms but there's a whole lexicon and there's a whole how to and to use your word there's how you should mm -hmm. present yourself mm -hmm. uh, it feels in these dating apps and then I've been hearing, my daughter studied psychology uh, up at St. Andrews, and, uh, and we have lots of conversations about how it is on campuses in the United States, mm. for example, mm. where the, this notion of contracting mm. is, is, in, is almost important for the purposes of safeguarding mm. any act before, as my son had experienced, two friends being expelled just because the the woman in particular said that this person aggressed me because i had a, took advantage of me because i had a beer hmm. and there was no there was no other ex, witness or anything else and it was hmm. just under the the premise uh, that one person says the other person was horrible hmm. and then there's no court system it's just you're out so yeah. somehow this contract and i don't want to talk about it as a lawyer but this is where it comes hmm. in we, we've come to a position where in order for ma you know, masculine toxicity to be eliminated from the equation, hmm. me too, not to happen, there's a, a need for men to safeguard themselves by saying, or at least in the men, you know, heterosexual, so to speak, elements, that they have to safeguard themselves by saying, are you sure you really want to do this? Because if you, I don't want to have a, you know, a post, a post sexual intercourse, hmm. uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm back in the, I'm having problems okay so the way I cover this when young people ask me about this and it's usually young men who ask me about this you know what if um you know the, this idea of um of uh how do they kind of how do they kind of almost prove that everything was consensual right um the I can understand why that is uh I can understand why young men are um feel anxious about this but the way i respond to this is to i repeat to them what the crown prosecution service in the uk guidelines say and so under a police interview if it ever got as far as a police interview what the the, the what the prosecution would want to see is would, would want to ask the the accused is well what steps did you take to make sure that it was consensual what were you doing to make sure it was consensual and that could be any of the things that I was just talking about, about the someone coming around to watch Netflix. So, you know, did you check in um, during it? Uh, you know, during during any kind of sex activity, were you like, you know, how did you, were you kind of, you know, they could ask like, were you mirroring each other or what were the kinds of activities you were doing? Were you kind of um, slowing down at various points in order to allow their body to move towards yours? Um, were you noticing any elements of passivity and just like just kind of stepping back and saying, well, perhaps they're not really ready for that? Um, if they had been drinking, you know, are you checking in about how how far they kind of want to go? And 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 but all of these things aren't necessarily verbal that we use our bodies to do this, too. And that we're picking up on everything that is happening in that moment, the vibe, the atmosphere, the you know, what been said before, what had been leading up to this, what happened afterwards, the nature of the relationship. And but also it's it's very uncommon for um for for these allegations to be false. Like sometimes these allegations aren't proven, but it's very uncommon for these allegations to be false. And you know, convictions for rape and prosecutions for rape in the UK are incredibly low for lots and lots of different reasons. And um 
I think the criminal justice system is and and criminal justice models, uh, the kind of legalistic models uh, around consent, uh, don't serve um, survivors and victims very well at all. And we've I think we've learned very little about justice uh, from uh, during our kind of I don't want to say post Me Too because we're still in Me Too. So in the e Me Too era, I think we've learned very little about consent and um, and justice and accountability and and um, gendered violence. And I certainly think that these kind of narrow um, legalistic models that I've been talking about have not only not helped, but made it worse. And I think that this is where we need to pay attention to this thing that I've been talking about, which is the consent as it actually exists, rather than the consent we talk about. And that is about talking about the things that we do to make sure everyone's having a good time. And these are kind of micro communications that we can all just start paying attention to in all aspects of our lives. And then when we pay attention to them in all aspects of our lives, we can help them to come to life when during sexual or intimate encounters too. Um, but uh, certainly, yeah, as I've been saying, I think that when it comes to sex, we sometimes teach, you know, we teach this kind of, uh, this kind of, uh, very different model of consent, which I think is just really not helping people at all. So I want to end, Justin, talking about this notion of consent in a workplace environment. Hmm. Um, I think it's, a, it's an interesting way to explore interesting conversation. And the, the context I wanted to draw out, which I, I know is featured in uh, your last book, about consent, mm. which is this notion of greetings and, mm. and the hugs. So I worked at a company back in the 1990s uh, so and the early 2000s mm -hmm. where we had as a culture a, a notion of hugging, right. uh, but not just any old hug, a, a long embrace. Gosh. Where, so this is pre-Me Too, right? Mm. And uh, so... And this was men to men, women to women, and men to women. And it was, a, we called it the Redkin hug. Right. And this hug was uh, literally five, seven seconds sort of thing. Wow. And, and the idea behind it was, well, this is how we are. Mm. Uh, you, you kind of, we, we set it up front. This is sort of part of our culture. Mm. And, and if you're not comfortable with it, then, then that's okay. You're just wow. not good. We're not part of, we're not, the hug isn't the, the thing you're in or out on. Mm. But we had a whole set of codes about how we discuss, how we operate, how we mm. behave, the words we use when we were discussing, for example, the hair, because this is what we were talking about in particular. Yeah. And bear in mind that this is the hairdressing industry. Mm. Uh, today, this is completely untenable. You mm. wouldn't, you'd, you'd get mm. laughed off the street or screamed out. Yeah. And then, and so then I was, I've talked to a few of my ex colleagues about this notion of where the hug is in society mm. post COVID and all that. Mm. But let's, in, in a, in, let's just help us out with this idea of let's consent on some cultural activity mm. that is, we feel is part of ours. And it could also be if I'm Korean about the Korean way mm -hmm. or the Russian way where they kiss on the lips, you know, right. men kiss on lips um, or the French way where mm -hmm. you come in and, and men handshake and the women and men and women and women all, all give two kisses on the cheeks. Yeah. Or three or four, depending right. on the different part of France you're in, which and, is confusing. Then, or, or the three and a half, you know, where yeah. you, you, you don't know, Oh shit. Oh, got, got the lips right. this time. <laughs> so talk about, how does one go about in a business environment talking or using the consent, let's say, avenue to bring? Yeah, well, um, thank you again for teeing me up. Um, if you run a business out there, folks, and you want me to come in and do a workshop with you, um, we'll happily do that, get in touch. Um, yeah, so I've been teaching about consent via teaching about how to have a really great consensual greeting. And I found it so incredibly useful. And so it was pretty much everyone who has done it because again rather than telling them what consent is and why it's important that they should do it we've been learning through practicing how we might do a more consensual greeting how we might bring more consent into greetings and consent is something we can always have more of rather than it being just a, a, a that exists or doesn't exist and so 
I think workplaces could have a... I think the issue is, it's about what you were talking about there with hugs, is is literally creating a an organisational culture which makes people do things that they might not necessarily want to do. And it almost kind of sets a the written script for exactly what it is that they should do. And I know a lot of people who really, really hate hugs, who find hugs incredibly difficult. And so I know a lot of people who, if they're working in that workplace, might not have wanted to work there for very long if they had the option, because they would have found those hugs really hard, you know, really, really hard. And so first and foremost, organizations need to think, are we writing our own scripts? Are we telling our own, are we creating should stories that aren't good for the business necessarily and are bad for the employees? And it's just kind of like a lose-lose all around. Are we um, in some ways restricting people's autonomy and people's capacity for uh, uh, for collective joy, as much joy as you can have in a workplace? Um by having these kinds of um by having these kinds of cultures. Like one culture around this, which I'm hoping this has changed, is you know, bear in mind also, uh, I've been a freelance sex educator for many years. I even when I was not freelance, I we didn't have an office basically. So um I've it's been a many, many years since I worked in an office. But I know people who do still. And you know, the after work drinks culture thing is is another one that could be looked at. Or, you know, because, you know, it's often, you know, if that's where key decisions are made and where key relationships are made, then who does that exclude? And who does that, who is, you know, which identities are getting privileged in that respect? But in terms of greetings, uh, I think that what we could do is just to, before we have a greeting, before we see someone, just to slow it down a little bit, just like a second or two, and just pay attention to what it is that what kind of greeting they might want if they've got their hands in their pockets and they just want to do a nod then maybe you could just step back and just don't go in their personal space but maybe just give them a little nod or maybe and hopefully they might do that to you too um if you're going in with your you with two hands so one hand at kind of like 10 o'clock and the other hand at like four o'clock kind of and you're doing a bit of a lean looking like you're going for a hug and the other person is kind of nodding and they're there 10 and four o'clock too and then that means a hug is on the cards and if you're gonna have a hug can you pay attention to how firm you both want that hug to be during the hug can you kind of notice what kind of hug you're having uh are you going to do the back pats which you know men often like to do to kind of somehow like make it a bit more masculine i know i do that sometimes probably um can you notice the uh any kind of sounds or you know nice to see you or the kind of hmm, you know you sometimes express in a nice hug and then can you notice the moment when you both want to kind of um disentangle from the hug and disengage from the hug and then notice what you might be saying to each other afterwards or how that felt for both of you and was there any kind of glimmers of joy between you were you experiencing a micro moment of positivity resonance where, you know, you're experiencing and the micro moment of positivity resonance includes various um, neurobiological things actually happening in your body. So the vagus tone kicks in and regulates your heartbeat. Oxytocin kicks in to help you tune in to the other person. Your pupils dilate, your hearing adjusts to the frequencies of the other person, your neural pathways map onto each other. Lots of lots and lots of things happen in these kinds of moments. Can you just take like a, a second just to kind of acknowledge that a nice thing has happened? And that's what a greeting is meant to be. A greeting is meant to be this nice little kind of way of introducing yourself to someone or saying hello to someone or to have this kind of a tiny moment of connection with someone, which can feel really joyous, whether it's a, a hug, a, a salute, a non-contact greeting of some description, a good old fashioned handshake or a fist bump. And again, this is, as you say, this is something we were all exploring through COVID. We all had to figure out what the hell we were doing. Um, and some of us are still trying to figure that out, but some of us have just gone straight back into the, the script of, you know, what you're supposed to do. And so we just think that, you know, if we are going to encourage people to go back into workplaces, which I, you know, I'm like, I'm all for flexible working and people working in offices if they want to, but surely one of the benefits of being in the office is having people around and having this possibility of these you just 
little moments of joy throughout your day from just interacting with other humans face to face. I'm not saying it's necessarily flirtatious or or in any way, you know, intimate or sexual, but just, you know, the joy of, a, you know, a colleague or a shared joke or, you know, uh, a kind of a, a smile across the office, you know, sometimes sometimes I fantasize about what it might be like for me to be in an office because I just work entirely by myself. And I sometimes think it might be quite nice just to, you know, you know have this like this buzz of energy that from all of these little connected, you know, interactions. And so I think for managers, the and for and for for anyone in in, in charge of like policy and, and trying to create a, a great office culture, I think that's the thing to really pay attention to is that how can we how can we facilitate these kinds of things and how can we rather than enforcing a culture of everyone hooks, can we instead just say, oh, let's just take a minute and let's all just practice and and try to tune into the moment and be in the moment rather than going ahead and doing the scripted thing. Because if we have this strong idea of a script and we're paying more attention to the script than we are the person, then we're not really maximizing the possibility for consent and we're not maximizing the possibility for joy. And I think that would make a really much nicer office environment. Hmm. Well, lots to unpack within that, but we time is is of the essence, Justin. The uh, the for me, the the way I I'm an older guy and and um I didn't go into the military, but I've lived in many countries and hmm. And I, I see the greeting as a not just not not a moment of joy. I see the greeting typically is a a first regard, if mm. you will. And yeah. and uh, who are you? Where are you? Uh, is in is in that you know just like you look at a book in the cover, you adjust, you see somebody tall, small, big, whatever. You, you mm. make judgments and generalizations. And mm. and my feeling is that like flirtation. There's uh, so much that's much more subtle. And if we end up having to de deconstruct every little micro moment, it can probably take some of the joy out of the, the moment. If Are we flirting here? Uh, so when you expose the flirt, it becomes wide open. Does that make it better or worse? And, yeah, and maybe, and that, yeah, yeah. if I could just finish, the, oh. the last piece is that it's maybe the discussion around this topic that is the inciting or the insightful, the illuminating element to allow for this discussion in the boardroom. Hey, yeah. what kind of habits do we have? Because I think it's important to, to make decisions that not everybody's gonna like. Because trying to please everybody all the time everywhere means you, you become nobody. Mm. So when you, when you wanna create a culture you, the the idea of doing everything and and allowing everybody to be everybody all the time is an amorphous, non delineated culture. It's a non delineated group, mm. and therefore it's easy in, easy out. Whereas when you have codes of behavior mm. in our company, this is how we do things. It's not mm. a legal thing, but mm. this is our tenet. This is our principle, our values, and we express those values through this way. Mm. which means words we use. And you can choose to be more or less inclusive in that. You can mm. choose to be more or less uh, affirmative or uh, you know, military in style. Mm. And, it, and for some, that will suit. And for others, it won't be. And then that becomes the gatekeeper, as long as it's well understood within the company. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think we're kind of agreeing and disagreeing here. I think that... Um, I think that we... I think... The one thing that a boardroom could say to that would that would in, improve the office culture and the office environment probably is let's all just pay each other really great attention. Let's just be really attentive and kind and respectful. And we do that collectively. And rather than imposing like a code of this is how we're meant to do things. And certainly if you have to negotiate every hug verbally before you do it, that does make it awkward. We practice, I do that as part of the activity I was talking about too um but just to just to slow things down just a little bit just pay a bit more attention to bring some of this really what we're talking about here is care and the value of care and what we might call soft skills and the ways in which this might you know um kind of help facilitate this kind of a, this collective approach uh where you know everyone is just you know i like to kind of think about you know just um when you know a football team is really singing 
you know, when like, it's hard for me because I'm a Derby County fan and they they never seem to sing. But, you know, uh -oh. when you see a really good football team and just everything. You'll every never pass walk is, alone. Well, thank you. You know, every pass is, you know, going exactly where it needs to be. They almost don't need to look up to know a player's coming in from the other side. And the, the passes are pinging around. Uh, like Spain versus England, sadly, in the final of the uh -oh. Women's World Cup. Yeah. You know, everything, you know, and they're kind of on song. And it's a little bit like, I think that... What I'm talking about here is about the possible. What? How do we get that? How do we be in tune with each other and in tune collectively? And I think we do that through these tiny little micro moments of paying attention. The kind of the the what feels instinctive and what can feel like it's kind of magic and instinctive is actually just a series of microprocesses we're not really paying enough attention to. And so I think in that way that can create an assemblage where everything is kind of just on song and everything just feels right um and just by paying attention and i think that in that way we can get over this idea of 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 again i've not worked in organizations so uh uh i'm probably overreaching my expertise here but i think that um this idea of instead of it, it always seems to be that there is this kind of in these kinds of discussions it's either is it horizontal or is it vertical you know, is it horizontal in terms of should there be no hierarchy whatsoever? Should everyone just be, you know, kind of autonomous, but autonomous knows within this kind of horizontal system where everything kind of gets figured out by consensus? Or is it vertical where someone is clearly in charge and everyone knows what they're doing? And I think that there is a, you know, to go back to a really great football team, clearly there it's a bit of both. You know, there's a manager who's facilitating everyone being really on song with each other and trying to create the vibe and the environment where they'll trust each other and um, and they can pay attention to each other and through these kind of acts of care and camaraderie and uh, and um, knowing each, other's, knowing each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses and, and uh, everyone's possibilities and how everyone can bring out the best in each other. And I think in that way, it's, it's both horizontal and vertical and neither in interest in kind of interesting ways but it can just be done by really paying attention to the process and really paying attention to the how of the how of doing things and that that is both that that's both good for individuals but also good for the collective and that you know that being part of that collective uh on song where everyone has a degree of autonomy and also is doing this for and, and is part of this greater good I think that's kind of like a win-win for everyone. Hmm. I think that's what a lot of people, I guess, in organizations try to achieve. You know, that's like the magic kind of element. And I think that um the, the way to achieve it is through is through this paying attention to to um to culture and the kinds of things that we can get everyone to do to be to be more attentive and to be in the moment and in tune with each other. And also to to know how to put down boundaries somehow. Uh, it it feels like a we could open a whole other chapter about talking about spiral dynamics, because what you were talking about feels very much like the interplay between me, we, and everybody. Mm. So there's me, the the individual. There's we, this collective, and everybody mm. is everybody, and and there's a there's a need to define things within that because if you're trying to be the horizontal, we love everybody, we take anybody. Mm. Well, good luck with that. Hmm. And uh, what is we? Well, we is some small group. Uh, is it big enough? Is it small enough? And hmm. and what what is we? And how do you yeah. define we? Yeah. <laughs> in and and I and I reference or I love to talk about Zemiatin's book We, in this particular regard. Anyway, Justin, we could surely. And I love the fact that we end on a disagree and an agree piece. Yeah. Um, great to have you on the show. How can people track you down? Uh, understand read up about you and hire you maybe or you or buy your books yeah um crucially what the best ways yeah yeah i think just go to my website justinhancock.co.uk and of course there's bish and and uh, i'll put as many little yeah. other links to your books and stuff in the show notes thank you very much for coming on the show again thanks for having me <laughs>